Oh, hey, everybody. Uh, Kevin Strange here, back with another uh, live stream. Another live stream on the Facebooks. Welcome. Um, you're joined by my friend uh, Zach McGaha. What's up? How you doing tonight, buddy? Doing pretty good. I wrote 3,000 words today, so my brain is on fire, which is awesome. That's a lot of words. How close are you to finished? On this particular project, I am about 10 days away from being finished. And I think that's about 19,000 words. So. You're, you're 19,000 words away from finished? Yeah. For a total of? Total of probably 50. It may go a little above or a little under, but more than likely it'll be right around 50. It's a pretty chunky little book. Yep. And Some people it? still consider it a novella, but I consider it a novel. Yeah, it's uh, there's like um, this conception of what a novel is that just won't won't die. This idea that novels, in order to be considered novels, have to be uh, 350 words or about 85 or 90,000 uh, word manuscripts. And that was like for a particular type of like um, airport turnstile novel in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And it just doesn't apply to today's uh, audiences. And uh, right, really uh, about a 200 page book or right around 50,000, 45 to 50,000 words is a real comfortable um, place for most uh, modern novels. Yeah, I agree because it seems like we talk in a more concise language. Now, not con uh, compared to like the 70s and 80s, of course, but like historically things were written way more, and way more flowery and people talked more eloquently, I guess. But uh, nowadays you can, like, especially if you're doing a literary type of novel, since you're digging so much into the characters, if you keep padding it out, it will uh, get kind of tiresome really quickly now. But for something like a spy thriller or a mystery, like I can see there being a long count like by necessity, but for something like the stuff I typically do, they can, they're like short, like a, mo a sort of emotional jabs, they can end up at 45 and 50 very comfortably. Right. But I'm probably going to, after I get this one done, I really want to, um, I guess, go a little speedy about the book produ uh, production aspect to get it to come out either alongside uh, Dinosaurs and Potted Plants, which comes out uh, July 31st, or maybe a little bit before it. So that would pretty much regain my catalog that was lost with Kensington Gore getting banned from freaking Amazon. That's a quick turnaround. Are you sure you're uh, sure it's going to have the, the editing it's going to need to uh, to be a tight and uh, well well edited like um, as far as for uh, uh, like grammatically. Oh yeah, definitely. I've always all the publishers I've worked with like have always told me I'm good at like editing because uh, most of the time they barely make any uh, corrections on my manuscript. The only time that was an exception was uh, when they went through and made me like redo my novel, a uh, hospitalized factory of pain in past tense because I tend to write in present tense. So that kind of sucked, but even the editing on both versions of that was pretty good. So. All right. Well, and what's this one called? I'm not really sure about the title yet. I've got a couple ideas. I don't know what I'm going with. Yeah. Yep. I started it. When did I start it? I kind of went slow at it at first, but I've been really picking up uh, steam on it. It seems because, you know, it's getting closer to the conclusion. And so the story's moving a lot faster. So, right. That's always a good feeling. And you're exclusively working on the uh, 
the fiction right now? You uh, you set aside the nonfiction? Yeah, I set aside it uh, temporarily to a give me more time to like read some of the books that I want to include, you know, as uh, research materials, and b just uh, you know. I feel like if I went away from this novel, I might lose that kind of like momentum that it's got building up. So I'm just going to keep hammering at it a whole lot each day. Yeah. I think I was here when you were drawing this one. Um, the pencils? Yeah. Probably. We're, we're at that point now where pretty much everything I uh, ink from here on out will have been penciled on the show. Yeah. When are you going to have this one come out? I should have the uh, I should have the inks done um, in the next four weeks or so, and then I have to do the lettering pass, um, which is the word bubbles and all the dialogue. Uh, that usually takes me maybe a weekend. And then, uh, and then I do the color flatting process, which will take me about probably two weeks. And then the color finishing process, which is all of the um, shades and textures that really make up the, you know, it's, it's what you would think of as the color. Yeah. The color flatting is just, it just gets the basic colors uh, knocked into place, but the, um, the actual, you know, um, uh, Like the uh, the tones and the the textures and all the depth and all that stuff that that all takes some time. That'll take about another two weeks. So I would say the whole thing is maybe two months away. I'm I'm guessing late July, early August. This thing will be uh, ready to go. Luckily, the editing. I'm not. I'm. I'm not good with editing. I'll make. I'll make a ton of grammatical errors and continuity errors throughout the, uh, throughout the book, and I'll have to um, shoot it over to my editor and let him uh, go over it and um, uh, luckily with a with a comic book, he was doing the. Um, he was doing the dead shit comic book one, one issue at a time. So only about 32, 34 pages at a time. And I mean, it, it took him about one day to do the editing on, on those. So I'm guessing when he gets a hold of this at 140 pages, um, I'm guessing the editing will take him maybe a week, maybe a week and a half. So luckily the, the turnaround will be um, real quick when the, when the thing's finished. So I would say that the, the uh, Indiegogo for this will probably launch in uh, mid to late August. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited about getting my feet wet with the uh, actual like book production aspect. Like, of course, the writing is the main thing, especially right now, because I'm not going to start anything until I have the book done. But I mean, I've already got it like outlined and I know where it's going. So in a way, it's done. But uh, I'm just ready to start like taking my time and making it into like a beautiful physical book because like even though I have like no uh, like artistic skills aligned with like drawing, I think I'm going to be able to teach myself how to do, uh, you know, like the online stuff like GIMP, which is like the cheap version yeah. of, or the free version of Photoshop. Yeah. So I'm going to mess around with all that. Are you going to, are you going to tackle it sort of the way that, um, uh, what's going on here? Yeah, the, the question you asked in the private chat, go right ahead. Um, uh, where was I? Oh, are you going to try to uh, tackle it the way that, um, what was Jeff Strand's wife's name, Lynn? Uh, I can't remember. I don't remember what her name is either. But I think uh, it was Lynn, yeah. Are you going to try to tackle it that way where you use like um, some uh, photography imagery? That you uh, manipulate, um, yeah, that's cool. Is that how um, Swamp Beast was done? I think it was. I'm not looking to like create anything like how he did. Like you know, he made the monster, 
this is pretty much going to be like a photograph, but with some, uh, uh, with, with like, I guess you call them filters over it. Like, I know how it looks yeah. in my head, but uh, it's going to be simple. So I think uh, I can pull that off, but I'm just going to try to make it perfect. But uh, like, I've got it completely in my head. It's just going to be hard getting like the right picture. I think I'm actually going to go out and take a picture. And, uh, rather than like looking up one, like uh, Chris Lesko does, yeah, that's probably what I'm going to do. It'll be cool. Just figure out how to do it through GIMP and then get creative with the top setting and stuff. I'm still debating on whether or not I want this book to be an ebook or not. I know ebooks are what sells, but uh, I still just love like the paperback original idea. Well, every, it'll everything will sell. If you if you make it to sell, um, Carlton Mellick, for instance, he always waits a year to put his uh, stuff out as an ebook because he wants the uh, he, he just would rather everyone buy paperbacks, and so he's built his he's kind of trained his audience to, uh, yeah. to buy paperbacks whether they whether they like it or not, whether they're normally ebook readers or not. They've just been kind of trained to say, oh, there's a new Carlton Mellick book. If I want it and I want to read it now. Then I have no choice but to, um, but to uh, buy the uh, the paperback version. So it's it's really it's more about what what do you want to, what do you want to sell it? There's a guy that I follow, um, my buddy, uh, not Jeremy Maddox, but um, Jeremy Daniels. He he follows this dude. He's even got tattoos from his uh, fiction mythology. His name's Scott. Um, I can't think of what his last name is. Scott something, and he uh, he does um, he does all his stuff as paperback and ebook. But his big business, like what made him um, sort of famous uh, for for being a fiction writer, was his audiobooks. He reads all of his audiobooks, but he has a podcast that he does every Friday, and every Friday he does like uh, twenty to thirty minutes of a, of a of a novel where he reads the ebook, and he has built this rabid fan base. Around this um, Friday uh, um, uh, podcast that he does, uh, and his his audience has been trained to uh, expect his stuff as audiobooks, even mm -hmm. though they can buy them as paperbacks and ebooks. The the real draw is the audiobook version and following the um, the podcast and being part of like the culture of his of his podcast. So really. Um, you know, you, you you can't limit yourself to, well, this is what I see other people in the small press doing. Because honestly, the people in the small press, they've been in the small press for 10, 15 years, and they haven't moved. Like if you're if you're worried about what um, if you're worried about what some author in the small press is up to, like, well, I better do what he did because that's that's what I know. Ask yourself, how long has he been stuck in that? particular spot and you know what what are his plans to move in any direction from that spot and like the the real successful people the real successful authors um, or novelists are the ones that innovate and create a fan base in some unique way because everybody writes books but if you can uh, nail your audience into a to a, a culture that's unique to you then you transcend all of that chuck palahniuk was was about live readings and planting people in the audience, I've said this a million times, planting people in the audience to fake faint and bring in the paramedics to uh, to resuscitate and revive um, these uh, people that attended his uh, his, his uh, live readings because his stuff was so extreme. It was making people freak out and pass out. None of that was real, but it built him, uh, it, it built the buzz around his live readings and he built a giant, uh, a giant fan base around it. Yeah, I'm actually thinking of uh, once my uh, whichever one comes out first, I'm going to do a couple of live readings from uh, either one of them on the quiet place or on here. Well, I thought you hated the, the live readings. I do. It's but maybe they it can be. Maybe I need to make that. Jeremy Maddox, 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 Maddox on on the Kevin Strange podcast for the first time ever. Hey guys, so. Uh, where is uh, Doug? He is, uh, I guess, there's some kind of echo thing going on. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I don't, I don't have headphones, so I don't know what to do. It's, no, it's, a, a, it's you, Kevin. I think it's me. Hey, wait a way. Yeah, I think it's the camera. No, uh, no, yeah. It's you. Let's hey, uh, hang on, hang on. Yeah, I was just gonna tell him to leave and come back. That's weird because it, it was happening when you were talking, but it's like it was going through his thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, what about that dang thing I put up on Facebook? It's just freaky, the freaking AI app to talk yeah, to. I, I mean, is it real or is it a troll? I, it appears to be real. It was one of those sponsored things. Yeah, if it's sponsored, ah, that's fucked up, man. I don't know. Yeah. Now, I've actually been noticing a lot of AI things sponsored. One of them was for like a burger flipping thing. It's because you talk about AI too much. I don't. That's the thing. I really don't. <laughs> Jeremy, man. Yeah, what about now? That sounds good. It sounds good. Yeah, I got Doug's caught up in a drama stream about comics yeah. over on YouTube. Yeah, so, so uh, there's apparently some major shots fired. Uh, on Memorial Day, people are bickering over uh, I don't know what on Memorial Day. Well, you, I couldn't even, if I tried to explain to you the craziness of, of that cult, like how, how bad off that uh, the uh, uh, Twitter comics is right now. I, I mean, it would take me hours to explain the whole thing to you. It's so, the minutia is so petty and ridiculous. So suffice to say, they never they never stop. And, uh, and Doug's caught in the middle of something right now. I'm not even quite sure what the particulars are of this tonight, um, but it doesn't look like he's going to uh, pop over here. He's got the link whenever he, whenever he, uh, gets back to Twitter and sees it, he's welcome to come on. But um. It has something to do with, uh, well, of course, Ethan Van Skyver and uh, uh, apparently doxing because every time that there's a, dox, a Discord server you know, and a YouTube channel involved, there always has to be doxing and people talk about, no, I've got the receipts. Yeah. It, 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 everybody talks about like, uh, you know. It's so bad in indie comics. I mean, I can't, again, I couldn't even... I couldn't even begin to explain to you all the the bullshit minutia. The latest, the latest, latest thing, as far as I know, this is less than a week old. Was they doxed one of the um, anti comicscape guys' uh, old old porn career and have him uh, being pegged? They have a video of him being pegged by his wife, uh, pegged like fucked in the ass, yeah. the dildo, and they're they're trying to like shame him for it. But I, I've never understood the the idea of. Uh, of shaming people for their, for the, I mean, these are the same people that say we're not bigots. We're not racist. We don't hate gay people, but they find kink porn from a guy. And then they think they can like shame him with it. It's like, well, wait a minute. It's a real picture. It's a real picture. Not a picture. It's a video. It's a porn video, on, but it's real on Pornhub. Yeah. It's real. Uh, yeah. This dude I, for real did this dude for real did pegging porn with his wife. Uh, I guess about eight or nine years ago. And they, they dug it up. He did it under a under a, a porn name, like a like a pen name. They dug it up and they're trying to shame him with it. And it's like, you know, you it's it's you're not looking good as trying to be these like open minded. We're not bigots. We're not uh, this or that. If you're willing to shame somebody for their kinks, it's like it just doesn't make any sense to me. But that's the latest thing. It's like because um, he's because he's a Republican and he voted for Trump. He's not allowed to have kinks. Hmm. Um, if if Doug's away from EV, EVS and and John Mallon and all of them, how is he still tangled up in it right now? They they, they uh, drag him back into it because he's really he's got a a, a, a big. Um, if you talk about Doug to Naple, you'll get you'll get views. Mm -hmm. they, they just drag him. I mean, he he separated from himself from them over a year ago. It's been a year they've they've uh, continued to try to drag him drag him into it. And he's not innocent. I mean, he'll throw jabs their way uh, from time to time, but it's you know, it's just it's like anything else. It's like you can only take getting getting uh, getting punched at for so long before you just have to respond in some way. And then Ethan will fire up a a, a drama stream and be like, Did you see what Doug Tenapel said this time? We knew it. We knew he was a snake the whole time. It's like, dude, the guy said one thing about you guys in three months. You talk about him every day. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So why do they hate him? Just because 
either Christian or the other reason. The big no, no, no. They all claim to be Christians too. They all. This is the thing. This is the weird thing. Is they, these all are all people who claim to be conservative Christians? <laughs> these are all people that claim to be Trump supporting conservatives, and it's just uh, it's just a dumpster fire over there. And the big the the only thing people can really pinpoint about Doug is he was on a Comic Con panel last year at uh, San Diego Comic Con about uh, crowdfunding comics. And Brian Polito, the creator of um, Lady Death and Evil Ernie, was on, and um, and a few other big name uh, guys that have done crowdfunding. And when when uh, Doug was asked the question, "Who who are your influ like who influenced you to do the crowdfunding thing?" He just looked over at Brian Polito and said, um, "The guy that does Lady Death over there." He's like, "I followed and studied his uh, his because." The Brian Polito dude, the Lady Death guy, he does like four to five um, Kickstarter campaigns a year doing exclusive new um, Lady Death campaigns. And, and he raises like he raises like a quarter of a million dollars every time he does. So he's probably raising two or three million dollars a year doing Lady Death comics. And so Doug looked over and was like, well, I, I followed I try to follow that dude's model uh, right there. And uh, apparently Ethan Van Skyver got super butthurt. And was like, how dare you not mention me on the Comic Con panel? And Doug was like, uh, sorry, guy. It's like, I just told the truth. Like, because um, Ethan tries to take credit for, for Doug's um, uh, crowdfunding success because he kind of gave him the Comicscape platform um, a couple of years back uh, to promote that first Bigfoot Bill uh, comic book. And uh, I guess he wanted his props. Uh, at the Comic Con panel and didn't get him, so he started going it going hard on Doug and tell, saying Doug was a Doug's a homophobe and this and that. He's not uh, he's not real comic skate and all this stuff and it's just never ended. It's just been going on since since from that little petty thing. He didn't get a shout out at a Comic Con panel and it's never ended. And well, it just goes and goes and goes. Apparently, there's uh, uh, well the drama I've been following is between these. Uh, these guys, uh, these chapters of predator poachers, these people who try to carry on, you know, uh, Chris Hansen's work by entrapping uh, potential predators and uh, and saying, you know, look, I'm going to, you know, I'm, you're on video. I'm going to turn this into the police. Talk to me and, and maybe it'll go, we'll go easier on you and all that. And there there's drama between the guy of predator poachers, New Jersey and the one and the guy of Predator Poachers, uh, I don't know Massachusetts or something, and uh, sure, I'm sure they're drawing blood right now with each other, and uh, it, it it has nothing to do with catching predators, right. or protecting kids. Exactly. It's all over money. It's and all. It, and is it uh, is it the same? We have a Discord server, and we found that you said this, and we've got the receipts. Yeah. The same shit. How how yeah? Is it is it like CIA working this? gig over and over like by infiltrating communities and doing this how know. how does discord server automatically equate to eventual doxing you know all i know is everybody that's ever invited me to a discord server i'm like fuck you i'm not getting involved what the heck is a, a discord i have no server. idea is all i like know is it's, a, thing? it's just discord another way, it's just another way to talk like you can't already do it on social media or YouTube, yeah. and people get themselves into fucking all kinds of trouble with it. I, I have I no idea. What the big deal is about Discord, but all I ever and the very name Discord should tell you to stay away yeah. from it. I mean, Discord. What does that mean? It means like what disagreement, chaos. Yeah, I mean, yeah, chaos. Yeah, I don't understand the point of it. Like, all I've ever heard is like, I have a, I have a Discord. Come join my Discord server. Oh my God, did you see what happened on the Discord server? It's like I've never heard of anything good come out of it. Only drama, mm -hmm. only drama. But, uh, but what, oh my God, what happened? You didn't spill, did you? Oh my God, spill what? Did you spill your drink or something? No. Oh, the camera fell off the. Uh, uh, my, my mic stand here. My little. Um, makeshift camera stand. I need some more tape, I think. Is that a wine beer you're drinking? Yeah. 
Uh, that is a not your father's root beer. I was I was going to drink tonight to celebrate uh, Doug's first visit to Strangeville, but oh. <laughs> probably going to put it in the probably going to put it in the fridge now. I don't drink very often, so I've never had one though. Were they good or bad? Tastes like root beer. I mean, is I mean, does the alcohol make it better or what? I mean, alcohol. I mean, you can't really taste the alcohol. Mm. Just tastes like root beer. Which is why I drink them. I don't like the taste of alcohol. No, I don't either. Uh, I, I can do wine, but no, I hate that piss taste, that wheat piss taste of beer. Um, so what Man. is this I'm looking at here? Oh, this page? Yeah. Uh, well, we're deep into the, this is like page like uh, 50, 53 of the comic. So, I mean, we're, we're way into the plot, but uh, cousin Susie here is um, uh, she is, uh, I don't know. How, how do I explain this? She's. Hey, Andrew, what's up, buddy? Thanks for stopping in. So uh, cousin Susie is a cam whore and she, she's live streaming. See, she's got her, her uh, iPhone on a, on a, um, selfie stick there yeah and she's got one of those pl one of those butt plugs in that the <laughs> cam girls that the cam girls use where if you give them tokens they buzz so they're they're in it they're in a pocket dimension right now in cockhammer's um in cockhammer's crypt and the dead body of cockhammer is laying on this uh altar this slab and uh cousin Susie is, has interrupted this ritual where um uh, demon -y wolf from there was gonna uh, sacrifice Terrence and Parander and use their blood to bring uh Cockhammer back to life, and cousin, cousin Susie has interrupted the ritual, and then her, her interruption has been interrupted by her pay pegs uh, buzzing her butthole. So she's, <laughs> she's telling Demony Wolfram to hold hold her camera real quick while she gets off to the um, uh, to the butt buzzing. So I don't know if that I don't know if that was a sufficient explanation for this page. But I didn't even notice the butt plug before. That's pretty ingenious. Yeah, there it is. Do girls, cam girls really do that? I'm kind of behind. Yes. What? That's real? That's a real thing. Yes. You can put them in your vagina. Which is why you we're like your... one step closer to the apocalypse. Yeah, you can put them in your vagina. You can put them in your butt. It doesn't matter where you put them. It's, a, it's They're remotely triggered by giving the, the cam girl tokens. So the, the simps sit there and, um, and, and tip them like a penny over and over and over again and keep this thing buzzing. And then the girls overreact. Like they act like it's the most pleasurable thing they've ever felt in their life because they're getting paid. So you're like, oh my God, you guys. How have we it. gotten to this point in culture? You guys are. Oh. It's, it, it's pretty. Uh, like what kind of male female dynamic is that? <laughs> it's just freaking. It is the max, maximum, uh, maximum feminine. Uh, it's, it's, it puts women in their maximum uh, masculine and it puts men in their maximum feminine to sit there and be like, I've got tits, so pay me. It's just, it's a, it's a ridiculous um, a financial transaction that's completely devoid of humanity. And it's just, it's literally like this, like, I am a female. This is my female form. I deserve to be paid for it. And males saying like, yes, ma'am, here's all, here's all the money I made at Taco Bell. I worked at Taco, my Taco Bell shift all week. And I'm going <laughs> to, and I'm going to give you all the money by making your butthole buzz. And then you're going to fake, uh, fake act and overreact to it. Like, oh my God, thank you so much. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, and like they could give a fuck. Um. And my my stuff is always when I when I do Strangeville stuff, it's always an exaggeration and a satire of some culture. So I stuck, uh, you know, dead shit and Nixon and Hogan. That's a satire of stoner culture. And uh, cousin Susie's story arc here in the uh, Cockhammer Lives comic book. This is a satire of cam she's a satire of cam girl culture. It's it's a ridiculous culture. It's it's just, it's so stupid. And I so I put one of she's one of the main characters. And so I put this big ridiculous cam girl um, storyline into it. There's there's literally a point here coming up later in the book where her pay her pay pigs show up in person to save her from cockhammer. She's she's gonna she's about to be killed by cockhammer and the these fat overweight extremely unhealthy guys that watch her on the webcam somehow find their way to the pocket dimension <laughs> and save her from the uh and and they start and they start dying like they start sacrificing themselves in real life to save her uh, that's how that's just how pathetic um 
people who pay, pay uh, cam girls are. Um, so again, my stuff is always, you might uh, like the layman will look at this and be like, well, this is like smut. This is, this guy is getting off on, you know, big butts and girls with things put in their butts. And uh, the, 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 the reality is that might be true, but I also make it a point to create some kind of um, cultural statement around that. Like, I'm not just doing this in a vacuum. There is a, there is a, like a critical person purpose behind to be putting this kind of stuff in my, in my work. That might just be an excuse to, to draw big butts with, but with butt plugs. in them. Hey, Jeremy, where are you wanting to have a little debate with William Ramsey or is that not a thing you want to do? Oh, what me debating? Uh, yeah. Now uh, again, argument. I don't, I know you hate the word debate. Well, uh, we got Kurt Ballmeister on Sunday, but if you, if you can get him on, I'll talk to him. I don't, what is the topic exactly that we would be going on about? Um, I'm thinking something along the lines of like, like, when do you like, like how you draw the line of discernment when you know certain things in media are like manipulating you? Because I believe there's a good like middle ground answer. And I think I've found it and I think Kevin's found it. And I think I believe you and William might be on both sides of the extreme. Now, William might not be. I, I don't actually know his opinion on this topic. But uh, yeah, it's basically it. I think it would be freaking awesome. Well, if you want to if you want to get him on Sunday, uh, I'm sure we can find time for that you know um you only have eight hours <laughs> you know we, we were talking zach and i were talking about doing an, a, a 24-hour stream at some point this year J just because you know it's been done before very rarely is it is it done well um and you probably have to do several streams like a part one part two part three so that the file can still download at the end yeah, but uh, I don't know. It might be fun. I think that would be fun and doing something like a gigantic uh, multiverse thing again. That was just amazing. <laughs> I really like, like that multiverse thing. <laughs> I did. It's so weird because even though it was just on the uh, screen, it's like I I really felt like I was in some kind of freaking crazy uh, roller coaster ride where like reality was yeah. melting. It was hypnotic. It was like you don't have to freaking take drugs or drink or anything. Oh, it was freaking me out. It. it was freaking me out. <laughs> I actually got up and walked out of the room at one point because I was I couldn't take it. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, amazing. You seem to you seem to tuck her out last night though, Jeremy. We normally have a a pretty fiery final hour. I know. I yeah. think freaking Frank took all the uh, steam from it. <laughs> steam from uh, everyone. Uh, no. Um, well, I, I was juggling a lot of different things where, you know, I invited Mike Klein originally. And then before he comes in, you know, Frank's like, you know, hey, can I talk to Jeff Strand? And of course, I'm going to let Frank in talk to Jeff, you know. But then Mike comes in, you know, like after I've like way after I invite him and, and just before I'm about to let Frank in. And so I'm trying to juggle while still being respectful to both, to, to both them and everybody else. And, you know, I give everybody a chance to strand. And so my, my attention was scattered last night, trying to make everybody happy. Uh, that's part of it. I'm tuckered out tonight too, to be honest, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine you've been you've been going through some shit, and uh, yeah. uh, we, can, we can leave it at that. But uh, yeah. I can imagine that trying to run an eight hour, an, a giant epic eight hour uh, live stream on top of all that has got to be exhausting. Me just doing the, you know, I only do them for an hour and a half or so uh, at night when I do them. But trying to draw, uh, keep you know, and I'm the host of the show, so I got to try to keep uh, making sure everybody gets a chance to talk and everything. If if there's multiple guests on while I'm drawing, it's it, it is exhausting. It's a damn job. I used to be very vocally, you know, against uh, the whole Google Hangout model of like, you know, six get six, you know, people all talking over each other. But I don't know. I, now it's like uh, I'm kind of, you know, OK with it. Well, I think that it's got to be 
something like this is really chill. The three of us are talking. Nobody's really, we're not, we don't have to yell over each other all the time. Sometimes it happens, especially if we get into a topic that's like really worth debating. But it seems like a lot of that that shit that the, the war skis and shit and all that uh, blood sport stuff. It was six people just yelling nonstop. They never gave, they never stopped or took a breath and it was just chaos. It yeah. really, it, it really seems like when you do the quiet place, you, you're able to keep, um, it seems like there's a, there's an ebb and flow. There'll be like a, a 20 minute period where Gregor kind of controls the, the frame and then you'll, you'll take back control and you'll run it and then Ben will run it. And then Zach will, will have his his moment, and it's like everybody sort of takes their moment at the steering wheel, as as opposed to um, just trying to yell over each other for for hours on end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's because we're all we have like well tempered individuals for the most part. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> um, so you're saying I'm not a well tempered individual? No, I was talking about me. <laughs> We can get you going. I, I mean, that's my favorite thing to do. I I, I used to um, I used to be kind of reserved about coming on there uh, yeah. because it's you know after after work and I'm usually pretty stressed, especially right now with the COVID crisis shit. I mean, yeah. work is just bananas every night. But I have so much fun trying to get you riled up um, <laughs> on those streams that that Sunday nights. It's like even if I wake up Sunday morning and I'm like I am way too tired to be sitting on that stream until. Uh, two o'clock in the morning, my time. Um, it uh, it all by the end of the day, I'm always like, yeah, but because I'll start listening to it when I'm not on. You know, I'll, I'll pop it on in the car when I'm driving, and I'll and and there'll be some recurring thing going on. I'm like, I know I can fuck with Jeremy about that, <laughs> and uh, and so it just by the time I get home, it's the only thing I want to do is jump on the show and start fucking with Jeremy and see if I can get him riled up. <laughs> Man, I, there were a couple times, like I want to say three or four shows ago where jeremy i mean he was seriously freaking riled up like the yeah. one where he left to do the video game yeah and, and that's, that's the reason right. i want to get william ramsey on to debate him because <laughs> jeremy, that, that's what we were to, talking about getting you to play video games and only type to me is i consider that to be like a highlight of my I can, yeah. I like can, a highlight yeah. of my my experience on the quiet place was the time i i got jeremy so riled up he started typing at me from a video game I had now, to. Now your best, the best thing you did was the little joke. <laughs> the what? Jeremy probably doesn't get it or didn't get it at the time because it was a joke that was originally on Facebook, and Kevin kind of brought it into the uh, stream where he you got a book and you're just talking about it, and all of a sudden at the very end you like rip it away, <laughs> freaking <laughs> abomination. <laughs> <laughs> William Ramsey is under it. You just yell triggered. And Jeremy, he, I don't think he got Jeremy it. Jeremy knows stole that he's like, I don't understand the joke. I yeah, don't... yeah, yeah, yeah. I did get it. It, it took me a little bit. But uh, so, yeah, you got the a physical copy of, of Abomination. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of William Ramsey. I think that he, I like his work. I like what he does. We're going to get him on here at some point. Me and uh, Zach are going to needle him about uh, some get, get in depth about just the the weird, and I was going to talk. I'm going to talk to Doug about that too. That's one of the reasons that I want to have Doug on. Is Doug spent a lot of time in LA and Hollywood. He grew up in uh, California, and I really want to. I really want to dig into the, the this idea. It fascinates me. This idea of this occult underground that works inside Hollywood and inside media, and uh, and uses all of the this subliminal messaging. Like subliminal messaging for what? What is the end goal? Like it's clearly there. This messaging is clearly there. This symbolism is clearly there. And William Ramsey will tell you, oh, these guys have ties to the OTO and then this and that. What are the goals of the OTO? Why does that organization even exist? Oh, they have ties to Aleister Crowley. Why? What does Aleister Crowley have? Like what kind of power do these people perceive that his his celebrity has? Oh, his- it's pretty freaking insane when you actually look into it because there's everything from freaking British intelligence to creating demon aliens. I mean, it's some um, crazy. Enochian uh, angels, right? Basically. Uh, John D. John D. Uh, yeah. The guy who talked to, 
an, a, an, an angel, supposedly an Enochian angel that looked like a gray alien when he scared. Yeah, him. yeah, that, yeah, William, uh, no, uh, Alistair mm -hmm. Crowley did that. Now, John D. Man, too. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to see the symbolism for these things yeah. on music videos? It fascinates me, like, because nobody understands what they're looking at. It's not overt. They're not telling you, like, worship demons, and yet they create demon worship uh, idols and put them in music videos and on TV and in movies and in, in media and in uh, corporate logos. And it's just, to me, it's the whole idea of it is fascinating because it's clearly there. But then there's this, then there's all these different interpretations. Well, think about it. Here's the best way, in my opinion, to nail down why they do it. Okay, it's taking a Christian nation and every piece of media that we freaking consume, and it, you know, it runs a lot of people's lives, not in, in a bad way, but I mean, we all consume a lot of media and love it. What freaking like more evil of a way is there to like just really rebel against God than, you know, to have all these blatant satanic images. I, I get that. But what is the goal? Like, why am I rebelling against God? What do I well, get? It, it's not that you're I doing it. It's, the, it's, it's a complete cultural takeover. It's like it's a stamp. Yeah. On the takeover. What, do, what do they stand to gain by taking? Because they have. They've taken over. the. This is a this is a secular, godless culture that worships media that contains all of these esoteric Illuminati uh, symbols throughout it. What does that mean? What I would say the, the are symbols the like a, are just a stamp. It's like, this is what we've done. It's well, what us. are the consequences of that for them? What do they gain? What do they gain from the degradation or what do they gain from the symbolism? The degradation. Uh, that's Control? It's, a spir it's, it's a spiritual corruption. I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily answered explicitly in the Bible why, uh, you know, the, like every freaking force from like Satan to all the demons, etc., specifically want to corrupt this other than that they're just pure evil. Like it's not, I think it's a thing you have to speculate on. I don't know if it's really like... Maybe it's not even a thing we can rationally understand. That's kind of the path I always go down to. It's all these things that are really controlling us that we can't understand them like well, currently. Well, when Lady Gaga uh, does the whole Baphomet looking wardrobe, you know, for the Super Bowl and whatnot, it's not her saying, "Hey, I have this idea." You know, usually it's it's the set designers, the choreographers, and the you know the cosmetic uh you know the one who does her makeup and, and and wardrobe and all this it's all of them collaborating and getting together and they work for whoever you know uh puts lady gaga in that position you know uh creatively uh it, somebody said in some horror movie um once that celebrity is no longer an individual thing it's it's a collaboration. Celebrity is a collaboration between all these different, you know, uh, people, you know, who work together to to present their image. So, uh, you know, it's not Lady Gaga and, and all these other people, you know, these artists, you know, coming up with the, you know, the Illuminati pyramid as a backdrop and, and whatnot. Uh, it's the people that that their PR teams and their, their des set designers and, you know, cosmetic people that all get together, I guess, and present this image. Well, if you think about it, it's all kind of like a flip side, like just a perversion of what, uh, or like a perverted mirror image of what happens in Christianity where, you know, you get baptized and then you get the Holy spirit and then you're basically a tool for God. Mm -hmm their side is you fall in line with them you get a ton of money and you're basically a tool for like cultural degradation but you see it's all i mean i would say that there is some kind of like spiritual deadening aspect but it's like this material version that will never be like good enough but they latch onto it because i guess they're just spiritually dead it's really confusing and i get all that but i think that we get we get so caught up in the in the what that we don't we don't pay enough attention to the why 
See, so I don't, saying, I don't think so there's an saying, answer. The so what, we so can. What, you're, what you're saying is Lady Gaga goes ahead and allows herself to be dressed up and put into a, uh, a Baphomet aesthetic for the Super Bowl. And that is clearly, it's clearly satanic in, in nature. And uh, it's clearly anti-Christian in nature. And Lady Gaga goes along with it because Lady Gaga wants to be rich and famous. But the masses that are watching the Super Bowl don't know that that's an anti that that's anti-Christian symbolism. So what is the point of putting it in their face? Well, the, the best way I've we heard just wanna, we just want to blaspheme against God. They don't realize you're doing it. So what? So who are you blaspheming for and to what end? And I never see that answer. Well, I think the answer is a lot more, it's a drawn out thing, because if something starts, like say, you know, an art object or something starts, I guess, without the Holy Spirit as like a guidance to the art, uh, to the artist, it's not that the art object is going to be like super evil, but it's going to get co-opted in time. So we might not see the effects of it right now. But if it's being made with these bad purposes in mind or perhaps just kind of a nihilistic purpose, it's going to hurt people over time spiritually and mentally. Well, the thing that I hear over and over again from guys like Ben is they're not really Satanists. They only do it as shock aesthetic. And they're only, you know, and it's all these excuses for these for these anti-Christian, for all this anti-Christian symbolism. But that doesn't I don't feel like that's. Um, any more of an answer than what you're saying, which is just, you know, it, it's, we, we may not understand the reasons for it and it's degradation and corruption over time, but I don't understand what the goal is. Like why, well, why okay, look, so much effort and so many millions of dollars to make sure that these pop stars and these movies and these TV shows have this particular aesthetic. What is the end goal for the people doing the job? I don't believe that there's a way you can answer it without being part wrong and part right. Conditioning. We're not Conditioning able to what? like. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think there's a concrete answer because, you well, know, with our limited about it then, if, if well, with our limited rational minds, it's like we like Kevin. Like he knows something bad is going on with it. That much is evident, but. Well, we, just and we kind of got, we kind of got into we, this last night with the coronavirus thing. You you get put into a frame that's you either agree with the mainstream opinion or you or you uh, or you're a, or you're a conspiracy theorist and denier, and that's usually not the the answer at all. So what I what I find when I start talking about this kind of like occultism in pop culture, it's like people get real upset and say that's not real. That's not real. I don't care if it's real or not. What what gets me going is the fact that millions of dollars are spent to make it look like it's real. Mm. I don't care if it's real or not. That's be, be beside the point to me. I want to know why these people think it's real and why they, uh, uh, what, what are they devoted to? What, what is, what are the end goals of this Illuminati group? That it could be a form of idol worship. Like it might not be. What, are they, getting, what are they getting from the idol? I, I don't think that you always have to get something from the idol. Like, if I remember correctly in the Old Testament, like, you know, the idol is not always like an actual freaking demon. It's just something that humans create that they are uh, basically, it, it's a form of rebellion. We can't really understand why it is. I, you just, it's like getting into the, into the spiritual level because we know that it's wrong, but we can't put into words why it's wrong. We've been told that it's wrong, but I think any form of speculation is going to just, you know, lead to more questions. Now, I, if I do remember also correctly, that there are as, uh, certain times where uh, some of the idols are described as demons. I'm going to have to look that up because I remember. Do you know what I'm talking about, Jeremy? Um, Molech was a was a, a Jewish pagan god or something, right? Yeah, there's that one. There's the part where it says that God cast judgment on the gods of Egypt, I believe. So they were considered like, I guess, real fallen angels or demons. 
but there's another specific one where there's something about like statues or idols and Pazuzu, Azazel. I don't know. I can't remember if that's actually in the Bible or not. It might be. Samael. I don't, know. I don't know if that's those names are actually in the Bible. They might not be. I've not I've not read it through all the Old Testament yet because it's giant, but I'm pretty sure Samael and Beelzebub are. Yeah. I'm gonna have to look that up. Maybe not I'm... maybe not Pazuzu, I don't know, but um it's like literally one from thing. the Exorcist. Hmm? Was it Pazuzu, Pazuzu from the Exorcist? Isn't that the demon in the Exorcist? Yes, yeah. But there's like one sentence where like it mentions that these uh statues or idols are like actually demons or something, but I can't remember if that's old or new testament. Well, anyway, I'm going to have William Ramsey on here to talk in depth about this and, and really take me through the OTO and what the goals of the organization are and what, why people are drawn to it, what they think they're going to gain by um, pledging allegiance to a, this occult demonic organization. Um, you know, my guess is they're told that, the, that magic is real and that if they uh, practice the occult, then they'll they'll receive, you know, uh, divine or demonic infernal gifts, you know, here on earth, be it riches or clairvoyance or um, um, worldly power, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, if, they, if they're willing to, you know, denounce God and, uh, and worship these idols that we're talking about. Uh, my guess is that's the, 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 the drive of these organizations, but I don't know enough about them specifically. And William Ramsey has actually written books about the OTO, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Isn't that 9-11 isn't that book that he wrote? Doesn't that like really tie into the OTO and uh, occultism? Yeah. Have you read that one yet? No, I'm not. Yeah, I want to get a hold of that one and read that one too. That's the kind of stuff I want to talk to Doug about too, because Doug, Doug lived and worked in Hollywood for a long, long time. And oh, there he is. Speaking of, speaking of Doug, we were just talking about you, buddy. How late am I? Uh, I mean, you're about an hour late. That's okay. I'm doing. I was up to bed. And I checked my email, and then I get the uh, <clears throat> the message that I'm all, oh crud, that was tonight. <laughs> That's all right. I noticed you you were in some uh, in the middle of some comic state drama. Jeez. Yeah, I had a bunch of I just line up streams and I never checked my messages. So <laughs> that's my problem is it's not that I'm not available, it's that I'm incompetent. You've been a you've been a busy man tonight. Yeah. What's the uh, what's the thrust of the drama tonight? Um on my own channel, I, I focused something on our, our fallen vets. So I had uh Praetorian and Mecca McCheese on who both served and just talked about what it was like to serve and mostly focused on that. And then I went over to SWC uh, revived guys channel and just, uh, it was a giant crap fest, <laughs> Good gar garbage dump. Um, I try to stay out of it. I really do. Well, I I'm messing with my, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to get a real pretty camera angle here in just a second. I've got my uh, camera taped up to my mic stand so I can draw. Oh, but good. I can, it, I can pop it off of here and uh, and show my pretty face when I feel so inclined. Yeah. You're probably not going to like what he he's drawing, though. I'm yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna. Well, first of all, welcome to Strangeville, Doug Tanape. This is your your first visit to uh, to Strangeville, and we appreciate. Hello, you. my man, Kevin. Yeah, we, I've had you on my show. The first that, time I've been on yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, What was I going to say? Oh. All I did was for the for my cameras, I just bought another arm, the same arm that you use on your mic. I just bought another arm for my camera. I should do that. And yeah, I use. I use cheap, they're, like, if they're fifteen bucks on Amazon, so you can just get a little bendy arm. This is cheer. Cheers to. I don't drink very often because uh, I'll get the gout if I drink too many beers. That's right. <laughs> you and my buddy Ethan Nicole are always fighting the gout. Yeah. I, uh, I finally got on that medication that Ethan's on, so hopefully this won't cause any problems. It should. I've been told that if you if you take that that medication correctly, that you should be able to drink uh, at least in moderation. That's true. That's true. 
Um, by the way, uh, I really, really dug uh, Earthworm Jim, the Earthworm Jim games uh, growing up. So uh, if, if you were the one that brought that uh, character that to me, that, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Me and my, I created the character, but I was on a whole team of guys that actually pulled off that great game. Mm-hmm. You know, but, it just makes amazing programming and, and and all of that. I was an animator on it. What about the cartoon? Did you have any involvement with that? I was an exec producer on the cartoon. So I had some involvement on approving scripts and stuff, but not as directly involved as I did was on the game. Mm. By the way, this is Jeremy Maddox. He has a he has his own YouTube show called The Quiet Place where he interviews some pretty high profile um, horror fiction authors. Oh, cool. That's what he's called, calling himself Tennessee Trash in this. Uh, yeah, in this I'm part of Tennessee Trash. I'm here in Franklin. What part of Tennessee are you in? Uh, King Sport, you know, uh-huh. John City, Bristol, the Tri City region. Yep. Um, yeah, that's that's where I am. So, and you have Charlie oh. White art as your avatar. I have what? The Jeremy uh, art that art that you have there is by Charlie White, who yeah. did a a series called. Uh, I believe it was called Jeremy. Understanding Joshua, I think. Understanding Joshua, I'm sorry. It's Joshua, not Jeremy. It's so bizarre, but so uh, fascinating, right? Yeah. He was a uh, an effects artist that a lot of our Neverhood guys had worked with when he came up with that camp, with that um, artwork. Oh, did yeah, that did you work on Neverhood, too? I created Neverhood. You did? Yeah. Wow. Th- that was a pretty cool game. Uh, very, very offbeat for its yeah. time. Well, what else did you work on? Well, like what, Rayman or anything else? No, I do like Rayman. The new ones were great. Mm-hmm. The ones that came out like five years ago or whatever. Rayman well, Legends? I did. Um, a- after that, I got into TV. I did comics and TV. So I did Cat Scratch for Nickelodeon. was in the early 2000s. And I've done about a graphic novel a year for 20 years. Hmm. That's about what I've been doing. Speaking of, let's pull up your uh, campaign here. We, uh, we'll, oh, yeah. do, we'll do a little promotion. Well, uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to introduce you to my other friend here, Zach Magaha, up in the corner. He's also Hi, a Christian dude. He's a Tennessee Christian. Jeremy's a Christian as well. But uh, My Christian people. Yeah. Zach, yeah, what yeah. Tennessee you at you in? Morristown. Okay. How far away is that from uh, Franklin? I'm not familiar with Morristown. Uh, it's really close to Knoxville. Oh, okay. There you go. Franklin's near Nashville, right? That's right, just south of Nashville. Look at there's my book, Big yeah, Book. Uh, uh, graphic novel work. You got one uh, brewing up right here, Bigfoot Bill Two: The Finger of Poseidon. Yep. Sunday now on the Indiegogo. You're up at uh, about a quarter million bucks on that. Bet. We just crossed a quarter mil at two hundred and sixty thousand. I have to go bleach blonde. You know, I myself have dabbled in the crowdfunding. I raised two thousand dollars last year. Good man. Yeah, I was there when your campaign was raising. You sure did. You had me on your show a couple of times and uh, <laughs> gave me, gave well, me a little now. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to have us little creators on your show, but you do. And we it, really it, appreciate it's that. more important to the little ones on than the big ones. Yeah, it is. And it, it really goes to show, you know, uh, there's a, there's, you really, you can really like hanging out on the internet like we do now. You, we wouldn't have done this 10 years ago. We wouldn't yeah. have done this 15 years ago. But you like the, the character and the metal of a man is really shown when you spend 15 hours a week uh, with a webcam shoved in your face. Yeah. And you sort of get, we sort of all get to know each other. It's, it's really odd how uh, maybe we'll never meet in life, but we really get to know each other's personalities. Yeah. And you can only fake it for so long. You can only be disingenuous for so long when you have a webcam in your face every night or, or, or every other night. And uh, Doug, over the last couple of years, uh, you've, you've, I, I, most of the, you know, they tell you don't meet your idols because yeah. they'll disappoint you. And of course, all, all, all men are, are fallible and will, and will dis- we would disappoint ourselves. Yeah. But uh, I've, I've found that um, the more, the more I hang out and watch Doug to Naples streams, the more respect I have for the man. Um, in addition to the creator, like the man, Doug to Naples, you're a good dude. And I appreciate you uh, giving us a, a little window into your life. Like you do. That's very kind of you to say. I do think it's neat to get to see windows into each other's studios though. Cause usually before 10 years ago, this was all cut off. Yeah. It was just a mystery. It's like, am I the only one? Am I doing it the right way? Now you look into someone's life and they'll tell you, this is how I write. This is how I draw. This is what my house looks yeah. like. I'm drinking this beer, you know, 
it was your it was your uh, videos about uh, Clip Studio that actually led me to finally dive in and go ahead and try to illustrate my own graphic novel, a dream I had had since I was about eight years old. And I yeah. took the lo I took the longest way around. I started writing screenplays and doing little backyard short films, which led into doing uh, shot on video feature length films, which led me to a career in not in in, uh, in fiction, writing novel, full length yeah. novel. And then finally, when I was like, okay, if there, if there are, cause I was pretty proficient with Photoshop, putting together book covers and, and uh, you know, that kind of stuff, promotional stuff for social media. And I was like, if I, if this clip studio program is anything like Photoshop, I think I can tackle this. And um, it's way better than Photoshop, ain't it? It is. It is oh yeah. Yeah. Cause it has all the shortcuts that Photoshop doesn't have. You got to do about seven steps to get to one, one yep. step doing clip studio, but I've, uh, you figure out the basics of that program and you're on the ground running and then it's just draw. draw yeah. And write. yeah. And I've been, I've been drawing every day, at least five or six hours a day for about two years. And I'm not, I'm not good by any matter of means. They tell you about a lot of stuff to work on, man. Yeah. They tell you you need about 10,000 hours to, to do something really well. I'm only about 3,000 hours into my art career, so I've yeah. got a long way to go, but I'm having so much fun doing it. And, I'm about uh, 20,000 hours into mine, and I just suck so bad. I'm a slow learner, so I, no, I, I wrong love, long enough, you'll figure something out. I love looking back at, uh, you know, you uh, your style, like with this Bigfoot Bill stuff that you've been doing, your style is evolving so much, and you're, you're uh you're paying attention to to so much more kind of I don't know if you could say detail stuff, but you you really like if you look back at your older stuff, um, I've got Black Cherry right here. I wanted to talk to you about a little bit because, well, I had a few themes that I kind of wanted to um, uh, let me see what, a few themes that I wanted to discuss with you. I actually have this signed. If you if you see, I, 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 I've oh, never yeah, there it is. Black Cherry off of uh, Amazon and it came signed. Very cool. How much do you think that's worth? Nothing. I don't know. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, uh, on, if, you look, like, if you look back at the style of even, even this was what, uh, about 12, 13 years ago? Yeah. If you look back at the style, ago. this is so much, it looks like you moved so much quicker when you were making these, uh, the, the black and white comics from 10, 10 plus years ago. Well, that's a, each book, I kind of approached the style differently. So in that one, I was really studying film noir. Uh, so I was yeah. really going for just like that high contrast and I was doing it with mostly the big uh, horsehair brush. Let me see if I have one here. Kind of the big Japanese horsehair brush. Yeah, you can definitely see that. Yeah. So it's more coarse, but there's, uh, but I really studied film noir a lot for that book. I, yeah. I, so let's talk about film noir. Look at that shot. Yeah. That's the alien. The alien. Yeah. Look at that. There's hardly any, there's hardly any picture there. It's yeah. mostly black. I'm yeah. terrified. I'm terrified of this. I'm gonna. Yeah, do that's a that's a great panel, man. That's oh yeah, it is absolutely. I'm gonna when I finish this the the graphic novel I'm working on now. I'm gonna do a small sixteen pager that I'm gonna get do black and white and give it away for free at conventions. And I'm gonna do a study of Black Cherry and and some of your other uh, black yeah. and white stuff and really try to uh, challenge myself to do that film noir. Really go deep into the shadows. The the micro yeah. What uh, one thing that I studied when I did that book, obviously I'm always looking at Mike Mignola's Hellboy, but um, Frank Miller's work in Sin City was a big influence on that. Frank Miller's high contrast work in Sin City. Um, I'm trying to think of who else does really good lost line work. Um, Alex Toth, who did uh, Space Ghost, Alex Toth's comic work. Um, a lot of the creepy and eerie um ec comics kind of horror comics um yeah. they tended to do higher wally wood is a real uh famous uh just kind of heavy inky guys um with eisner you know who did all his graphic novels drops the avenue and contract with god those are great black and white books very film noir in their uh their style so if you're looking for the other thing that you'll pick up if you if you ever pick up a eisner book you know, his graphic novels were like, um, um, he draws a lot of men in suits. Yeah. So one thing you have, everyone has to learn how to do at some point is figure out cloth. Yeah. And you look at someone else who did, and you see his shorthand for the bend in the elbows and where the suit hangs and where you put the tie and all, and where you drop the shadow into the neck. And, and he has just like hundreds of bodies in every book. 
to draw from, you can't help but just start busting through some serious ceilings on your artwork. And something as universal as like men in suits is something everyone needs to learn to draw at some point. Yeah, there was there was a book also that you you recommended with um, Ellis. You you guys recommended a uh, what is it called? It's a it's a book about inking. It's a big ni nice big tall. Uh, oh, frame is it framed ink? Is that the yes, one? framed ink. So I bought that. I have that in there too. That's a that that does a lot of the uh, black yeah. work. Film that's work. fantastic work. That guy is nuts. That DreamWorks guy. Yeah, he's a DreamWorks guy. So yeah, I'm looking forward to to break it, and it's just going to be a short little 16 pager. So I, I'm not going to feel as when I do these big projects like the one I'm working on now at 140 pages. I'm just I'm barely hanging on. Yeah. Page to page, I'm just desperately trying to get something down that doesn't look like complete shit. I'm only two yeah. years into the into, into the drawing, so every I, I fight every panel, every page, every finger, every yeah. nose, every mouth. Um, and I and I'm also trying to challenge myself. And do you do you find yourself running into uh, repetition? Like you draw the same mouth over and over and over again. Yeah. I try to break my. I, I'll notice like I drew that same mouth six times in the last four pages. I need to break. Yeah. This. You'll you'll fall into formulas and you'll catch yourself doing it. I and I do that a lot. Um, it's just it's kind of lazy training because that's also where your bad habits come from. I make the same mistakes over and over. On almost every page sometimes uh, <laughs> the way I draw certain hands and stuff like that if I don't rethink it and really concentrate on breaking it I will draw the same kind of mouth and the same kind of eye and in general the same three-quarter head and I'll just go this yeah. is kind of boring you know? these, are, these are Doug's Naple hands if I've ever if I've ever there seen you go look at that Naple hands you yeah. draw a lot of, a lot of hands like that I got those hands from um, a lot of them came from two sources one was I downloaded the Emperor's New Groove model sheets from the internet and they draw hands a certain way, Emperor's New Groove. Um, and the other one is um, Kyle Baker's You Are Here, which is probably the greatest film noir comic ever made. You are, so Kyle Baker's cartoonish hands, I really learned a lot about hands by, I drew every hand in the book on a, in a sketchbook. Yeah. There's another one that I have right here. Uh, that I've been studying also. Uh, when I first when I first got into your stuff, I was like, I'm not buying these black and white books. I want my comic books in color. Yeah. But the longer that I, now that I'm now that I'm illustrating, it's like you you learn more from these from the ink work than you do yeah. from me. Once the color work and the texture work and all that stuff is in, you really can't see the the work, right. the, the uh, construction that, that goes into it. But uh, right. black and whites are where it's at, man. You can't yeah. pick black and white. Just the first page. I'm, I've got Monster Zoo out now. Oh, the first page, the first yeah. panel of Monster Zoo. How, how were you like? Uh, okay, great. We get to start a we get to start a new a new uh, project. Oh, now I'm going to spend the next ten hours designing the very first. Oh, that panel. was bad. That was bad. That was that took a long time. <laughs> the first panel of the first page. Let's spend all the how, how I many days? And a pretty big money shot on the first page of my books because then if you do another page of real sucky stuff, people, yeah. You know, you you impress them at the start. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah, definitely. And this 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 is a crazy book. Uh, That's a, that that book is. I was hitting a peak of some kind right around then. I don't know if I can even hit that again. The the kind of ballsy stuff like this this here, where you've got the the foreground character. You've I don't yeah. know how you would. It's not stippling. You just drew a bunch of lines through him. Yeah, it's it separates uh, him back I, from that from that background in a way that I would never think to, to do that as a way to, to separate my, my uh, yeah. foreground from my background. Yeah. Look at that. So that's one method is, is hatching and there's cross hatching. If you do the lines going the other way, or mm -hmm. if it was film noir, we'd have to do a core shadow of solid black, which is really hard to do down a front of a face. Yeah. Face. Yeah. So was that, uh, did you pull this from another source, like a, a Frank, uh, like no, a, the, a lot of that came out of my head, but I, I probably spent a lot more time thinking about it before I drew it. And, and that was also coming off of um, Iron West right around then too, which is probably my best art I've ever done in a book. That, this, this is really strong art. See, that's a core shadow on the foreground yeah. character there. Yeah. With his hat on there, uh, all black in the foreground. That's hard. I haven't seen that probably since it was published. So I'm looking at it going, that's pretty good, 
pretty good work for me. <laughs> pretty yeah. good. For me. Like I said, I've been getting into this, the, 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 your black and white stuff, because you don't have, you can't lean on your uh, colorist. That's right. Go in there and, and, and separate things and, and figure it all out for you. You've got to, you've got to build that up uh, yourself. So that's, that's stuff that I'm just like, I've been reading these, I've been looking at these books over and over again for two years, trying to, trying to get something out of it. <laughs> yeah. You really, you, uh, you learn everything at the black and white level. Yeah. Black and white is way more important than the color and you can communicate and the history across the vast history of comics black and white's always been more important than color that's where you put down your characters acting and the initial line work and the structure and all that happens at that line work and if you don't fix that if you don't get the line work right it doesn't matter if you color it it's going to be crap so you might as well get it right what you're learning about black and white is more most important part of your comic education and i'm still working on my black and whites i'm still trying to reach like even where i was back on monster zoo yeah that's a good one man you you really knocked that one out of the park. yeah it's a good dang good book i think i used to take a lot more time on my <laughs> stuff and now i've just been pound like you know, 160 page books you got to pound yeah well but they but still i mean i'm that that uh the, the work that uh gabe uh el taib is doing uh coloring these oh. uh Bill books. Bigfoot Bill, he's killing it. It's a different kind of, I mean, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a completely different style. You can see your Monster Zoo work in your Bigfoot Bill work. Yeah. But you guys collaborating, and Catherine too on um, Earthworm Jim, she yeah. has more of a kind of a watercolory style yep. with them. Very painterly. And I let them kind of run with the colors. I don't have a strong opinion about color as long as it's clear. That's all I tell them is clarity. So if you if you take a, a clear black and white image that I give you and you make it less clear with your color, then I might have something to say. But overall, if they make any choice of any color and it's clear, I, I OK it. So you, about 99 percent of their work is goes through without edits. And Gabe is a I mean, he's a pro. He's an old school oh. D.C. That guy's colored everything. So it kind of has a more mainstreamy house art style to it, which I like. Um, and then Catherine's is a little more quirky and painterly and cartoony and feminine. And so I like that in the Earthworm Jim work too. Well, and the, the Earthworm Jim uh, writing, the story is much more cartoony. It's yeah. weird because Bigfoot Bill is, is a comedy. It's a goofy comedy also. Yeah. But somehow there's a distinction between, because I think... I out of all the stuff that I've read of yours and I've read a lot of it um, the Bigfoot Bill storyline is is some of the strongest stuff that you've written yeah. and having Gabe be that strong on the color end of it is really I'm, I'm super making it one of my best stories that ever told I'm and I'm barely in control of that story I mean <laughs> uh, I'm just I just finished up book two and I'm doing a rewrite on book one so even if you've already got that you're going to want that book this new edition Oh, I know. You got me on the more you've been talking up the reprint of the first book. I'm like, I don't know, because I've got the first one. I already got no, the I got the making of and the and the uh, the hardback. So I've got all I've got. But you're putting you're putting new pages in now. You're you're changing the story, you're relettering the whole yeah, book. It's going from. Yeah, it's it's going to read like a new. A pretty new experience. So I, I'm happy that you got the original, and I'm not doing it on purpose to jack people. <laughs> you know, jack people on a twenty-five dollar hardback. I'm like, look, if I'm going to print it again, I'm going to fix everything that I that I I wished I took care of. I'm going to. You can't jack people on a twenty-five dollar book when you when you ship it when you ship it in a in a box that looks like this. That's right. This is like, oh, I got to redesign the box too. That's the other. Thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is um, uh, here. Here I'll show you some of the. Uh, here I'll share. Here's the new, a new look. This is the first time anyone's seen the new Bigfoot Bill. Wow. You'll see. Uh, it opens now on the Poseidon story that was in the making yeah. of. So this is already a brand new, not brand new. If you got the making of, also, but so this is. Uh, a whole other story put at the start. That's uh, what is that? About fifteen pages. And it's a kill. Yeah, I have it in the making of. It's killer. Yeah. First, that first page of the of the comic, though, if you go back a little bit, that cityscape. Yep. I watched you draw that live, and I was like, 
I don't even know what I'm looking at. I mean, there was yeah, something that 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 again. That's the first page. So it's yeah, you murdered you murdered that, and then uh, and then the colors on there that just that, that, that is a two page yeah. spread. Yep. Yeah, this is a great book, Bigfoot Bill One. This is a great story. Let me try and find you a new page so you can see. Uh, I, I I packed. Well, this is new. So he, he's passed out here, and then we go to his dream. So this two page spread was in the original making of, and I've got some extra dialogue on here where he's thinking about a family before he wakes back up. Wow. Then it goes back to the regular story. Now, uh, Bigfoot Bill. Oh, well, here's a new. This is a brand new page. Here with a new character. This is the doppelganger. And all this dialogue's new. This is all colored by Gabe. Look at this coloring. Look at it. It's great. It's these are killer money, money pages. Oh yeah. It's funny you crammed you managed to cram a new character into the first book. That's funny. Well, he's he plays a pretty big role in the second book. And I oh, realized yeah. I go, you really should set him up in the first book. Here's some new moth. There's way more Mothman backstory in this book. He's too. a great, he's a a great character. character. Making of, I put dialogue over it. It goes into his whole kind of past of wow. who he is. This is all wow. new. I love that one. Yeah. Yeah. He's a killer character too. As, as it uh, sort of uh, climaxes near the end of the book. Uh, he's a way more evil monster now. This is a new two page spread too that Gabe colored. Bigfoot Bill's arch nemesis is Mothman? Yes. Okay. In this book, mm. this is Mothman's kind of a secondary villain to Poseidon, who's the main villain. So, what's with the armor? Uh, the the armor with a face on his chest is that what that is? Yeah, that um, this stuff is this is the Kraken that Bigfoot Bill wears as a as body armor. Gabe went in and recolored a lot of these pages too. So. Recolored this one. Very vibrant. Oh yeah, it's great. Gabe. Kelsey Shannon. This is Gabe. Gabe. Yeah, Gabe works on Gabe works on DC Comics, so he's a pro, he's a legit uh, comic book pro colorist. Yeah, he's really. You just you just he recolored this page. You just give it to him, and he just he kills it. He recolored this one. Recolored that one. Recolored that one. I love how Mothman almost looks more like a mosquito. He does. <laughs> yeah, he's got this evil beaky nose, and he's a screwed up, pretty screwed up guy. So, you know that's yeah. that's something. Uh, you know, John Wayne Gacy, uh, a, a professional clown, commented on the way he painted his face. How it was all it was sharp. You know, uh, points like yeah. angular, and, and that 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 scares children on a subconscious level. And so it might be a good thing for villains to have pointy facial features. Yeah, I kind of like the Joker, you know. He's, yeah. just, uh, he's, he's, we also go into some of Mothman's origins that he was put together by us, by these scientists, and they made a made him out of Sandhill Crane Parks. There's a new two page spread. Gabe colored that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's just beautiful. Yeah, and these books are twenty five dollars, so it's not yeah. like you're, you're not jabbing anybody. Look at this thing. I watched you color this. I watched you draw this too. You're like, I have no idea what I'm even drawing. That was harsh. Did Gabe redo that? That looks redone. He, did. he recolored that one. There's the two two page watercolor from the making of. So you, you can see, I worked it into the story. These two page spreads. Yeah, this stuff near the end with the the cut, giant Bigfoot Bill versus yeah, right there. Yeah. Look at that. I mean, this is just, this is great. And this is the kind of stuff that what I, that's what I mean when I say like your, your older black and white noir stuff like Monster Zoo and uh, Black Cherry, it's great in its own way, but it's not this. Yeah, this is a new two page spread right here. Yeah, this is next level stuff. New stuff. Yeah, the, the eyeballs coming down uh, Mothman's arm. It's great, great touch. You do monsters so well, and it's um, – Well, I love monsters. I mean, come on. That's why every comic artist loves monsters. Yeah, well, that's, that's again, one of the – and we'll kind of kind of shift this into – do you have a little bit more time you can spend with us tonight? I got I to gotta go to bed, man. It's 11.20. What time is it where you're at? Are you, are you here? It's 11.20 here, too. It's 12.20 okay. here. Yeah, it's an hour past my bedtime. <laughs> well, we'll let you get out of here then. But uh, yeah, we, we we talked up the book a little bit. Uh, we want to have you on again, though, to talk. talk yeah, just send, send me the link. And if I'm up, send me an email during the day and say, I'm going to send you a link and then send me the link. And if I'm up, yeah. I'll 
I'll jump in. If there's no if there's a crazy comic skate drama going on that's sucking oh, me uh, Would you want to come on The Quiet Place sometime? Yeah, anytime. You just got to just gotta start PMing me um, on um, on Twitter is usually how I find my streams. Yeah, I don't have Twitter. Um, well, that's probably a wide move. We'll get, we'll get, uh, uh, on Facebook, maybe? I don't have Facebook. Yeah, we'll get all of them for you, Jeremy. We'll get them, we'll get them going. Or throw okay. me an email, dougt at tenaple.com. That works. That works. Okay. Yeah. I guess I rarely, because I'm working so much, I rarely even check my social media. A lot of my social media, I turn over to my assistant. Mm -hmm. So so you I'm can't stand it either. <laughs> I just, I just, uh, I need to keep my page count up and I need to get off social media. Yes. Kind of plan A. Yeah. So, and I'm about to go into starting in June. I'm about to go into crazy mode on Earthworm Gym, where I have to do a, basically a page a day for a hundred and about 140 days, 135 days. That's a lot so, of work. I'm gonna. That's if I'm gonna hit my deadline. So, what I do is I have my day's work sitting at that table. And I have this ironclad rule where you cannot go on social media until you at least pencil the page. And then I'll do my social media binge and then I'll go to inking and you cannot go back on social media until the inking is done. So suddenly what that means is it wipes out all my communication, but it's also stuff like even like paying bills through email that all goes to hell normal communications with family members and stuff. It just all goes out the window. So if it looks like I'm ghosting the entire earth, it's because I am. Yeah, you have to, because you're working at such a fevered pace. And that, yeah. that, um, that's another thing that appeals to me about your work is the, uh, is, is how uh, prolific you are. And it keeps me motivated. You know, I just, I can, I can get up in the morning and uh, maybe not feel like doing pages today, but I'll, you know, I know Doug's working. I know Doug's doing yeah. pages. Doug can you do be a pro. If yeah, I'm yeah. A pro, I can't just be a pro in name only. Right. I have to sit at my table eight hours a day. And then, lo and behold, I start drawing more like a pro. It, start, it really starts getting better. You start hitting your peak and getting up and getting up. And so uh, the work ethic in the end, I'll, t I'll just point the camera down too and do a show because I'm going to work anyways. Yeah, we'll get my YouTube show. And, the, and by the way, my views just go right through the floor when I'm doing like four hour things of me drawing. People always say, like, I just want to see you draw. I'm like going, well, you kind of do. <laughs> you kind of <laughs> do. Dude. Not, no one wants to see it for four hours. We right, well, and I'll have you on my show, too, when I do a drawing stream. Kevin, we'll just we'll hang. Yeah, definitely. And we, when, okay. we, when we have you back on, we definitely I'll call all you guys on. Yeah, when we when we have you on again, we want to talk. We want to shift the uh, conversation in the direction of theology, yeah. and theology and art, and then yeah. uh, we want to spend some time talking about your we, what we were talking about just before you came on was about the weird occultism in Hollywood. Yeah, actually, I want to jump in and add real quick because I did find that scripture that I was talking about, and I was kind of wrong about it. It was First Corinthians ten nineteen and twenty. It's not saying that the statues or idols themselves are demons, but that the people sacrificing to them are sacrificing like to demons. So huh. not, the statue's not controlled by a demon, but the we'll, we'll get into that next time. It's it's heavy. It's deep. We we get weird. Yeah, and I love talking theology. Yeah. So anytime, anywhere, man. Cool. Well, thank you very much for stopping by and giving us some of your time and talking about comics with me. Um, like I said, big fan and, and a big inspiration on my work, and I appreciate well, it. I'm a big fan of yours too, Kevin. I really appreciate your uh, diving in and doing it. You are doing it right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, my brother. We'll talk to you later. See ya. See you guys. And that was Doug Tenapel, ladies and gentlemen. Little little uh, little preview of what we'll uh, what we'll talk about with them next time. Sorry, sorry, guys. I got a little geeky there about uh, about the art the art side. But we'll get him going on the theology side and the uh, and the weird um, Illuminati side uh, next time. Sweet. Yeah, I got kind of geeky with uh, Strand last night. Was that last night? That was last night. That was a great show, too. We had, we had Jeff Strand and Doug Tenaple back-to-back nights. How about that, Jeremy Maddox? How about that for a couple of social outcasts, Jeremy Maddox? <laughs> yeah, I think we're doing all right now, yep.
I think we're doing just fine, my friend. Yeah, and a funny thing happened. There was another uh, post where uh, I commented on it, and then uh, Jeff O'Brien jumped on there, like making fun of me. Literally, no one paid attention to it, and all he got was a laugh react from me. And like, it was just amazing seeing no one like jump on there. And he, like, it's like in, in incel. I don't even know. Like, it's just such cringy. Uh, yeah, he, he called me a right, like an alt right incel. Right. Jeff, you it's say that like. like it's an uh, an insult. Nobody cares, Jeff. The wit the pe- the the Overton window has shifted. Nobody cares about your cuckoldry anymore. We want to talk about books. We want to have fun. We don't care about your bullshit politics, and you don't even care about them. Shut the fuck up. Put Don's cock in your mouth like you want to bad. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Nobody cares. That's the uh, fired up Jeremy Maddox I was looking for last night. Yeah. I think you, you. I think you let you, you uh, blew your load with Jeff Strand. That was a great interview, man. Mm-hmm. You're really pulling out some great interviews with these guys. Who was it? A uh, couple. Was it the just the previous week? Was that when um, Tom uh, Monteleone was on, or was that the yeah, week? That was a few weeks ago. See, that one's courtesy of me, so I get the credit for it. <laughs> Good. I'm changing the. I, I had uh, called this uh, Doug Earthworm Jim creator Doug Tenable visit Strangeville, but I. I changed it because I didn't think he was going to pop on. That was really cool of him because he was on a stream for a couple hours before he jumped into this one. He's got to be tired. He's been streaming streaming all night. Uh, so I'm going to change the description and the title real quick while we're still talking here. But um, hopefully, uh, you know what's, what's great about those uh, interviews too, you guys, is these authors, you give them so much time to talk and, you, and you're usually so knowledgeable about their catalog and so passionate about their work they always leave the quiet place saying, man, I'll come back anytime you want me to. Like they seem to have so much fun on the show. It's a fun show because the fact is it's not a place to A, sell books or B, be freaking normal. It's you get on there and you talk and it's just, it's laid back, but it's expected of you almost to like, you know, get in with like the real, it's like there's almost peer pressure to be more real. Because you're on there with like so many people, right? So you can't really be pretentious. Some people manage to. We won't name any names. I'm not a fan of all of your guests, but you can't win them all, right? And you, and I know you guys probably and you guys probably like them more than I have a low tolerance for writers to begin with. So, um, you know what the problem is? You know, I really, you know, what I hate is when some of them come on there and they have this self-important air about them, and they. I, control- they want to control how you ask the questions. I, I hate it when they do I, that. You're just dogging on William Ramsey. I know it. No, it's not just William Ramsey, but I mean. I didn't say I was partly right. Skinny, uh, you just missed Doug to April. Huh? Hmm? Skinny, buddy. You just missed Doug to April. Oh, he popped in here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We brought Doug, Doug on, and I, I uh, fanboyed out on him for a little bit. We were going to talk. Doug's an awesome guy, man. Yeah, we were going to talk to him about some weird theology stuff, but we'll save that. For next time he agreed to come back on the show and, and chill from from time to time so we'll have him back on as a recurring guest how you doing tonight? yeah i know uh he was streaming with uh, one of my buddies mecca mccheese earlier too yeah 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 so yeah he's making the rounds which yeah, i like did a lot of work on him I'm, I'm happy he was able to uh, come into this little channel and uh and and hang out with us for a bit that was cool of him but jeremy you were talking about uh the guests not wanting to control the uh yeah, the the, the the way they want to they want to almost control how you ask the questions. Some of them, you know, like, hey, you're talking to me now. This is how you need to approach me. Some of them go that route. You know, William Ramsey is one. Uh, I think we saw a little bit of that with Ken Ami last night. You know, where he's like, think so. no, no, he did. He, it's like I want to put a bow on this, and well, when we get to this. Let's talk. Let me let me touch on this. I mean, trying to make it more complicated than it needs to be. It's just a bunch of people talking, you know, and going back and forth, and that's it. It's like they, they're they too autistic about it sometimes. And don't well, get me wrong, I, I liked Ken Ami and want to have him back, but I, I hate how some of them try to approach it like, I'm going to tell you how to ask me questions, you know. Well, in his case, it's the hardcore nonfiction authors or the hardcore research-based nonfiction authors like – you know, if you get them talking about uh, the subject, they want to like explain the ins and outs of everything. 
Now I'm okay with that on these topics. It's going freaking cool. Yeah, but we spent 45 minutes on the nef cut hung up on the Nephilim thing, <laughs> and, and and we could have gotten to a bunch of other things. But he went. He had to keep expounding on just the Nephilim thing, you know. And it's like every time we tried to move past it. But no, I mean he was he was interesting, and you know I, I bought another one of his books because I mean they're only like 2.99 or something. So yeah. uh, and he's written like a hundred of them, but. Uh, that's know. the other thing about that show, your guys' show, man, is you sell the shit out of books. Yeah, we're all buying the shit out of the book. Rec the book recommendations you guys do are, are great, and I've listened to a lot of uh, I've listened to a lot of fiction podcasts. Not not in the last couple of years, but there there. I mean, there's like booked and uh, books. Uh, is it books and brews? That was uh, Frank, wasn't it? No, no, no. That was book beers and bullshit. There was a yeah. there's a different one that's a little um, a little more uh, literary. It was a bunch of women and one guy. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh God, I can listen to a lot of literary podcasts, and they, I don't think any of them have the passion for and the eclectic reading power that the Quiet Place has, because the the personalities are so like between. Zach and you, uh, Jeremy and Ben and uh, and Gregor, you have similar reading tastes, but also you go off in your own weird, different directions, and it, it allows for this palette of of um, passionate uh, book readers to just lay out any any style, genre, era of uh, of literature. You guys uh, touch on it, talk about it, and that's yeah. I'm the one that's alone, though. I'm the only one that reads like Faulkner and uh, Hawthorne and all them. Yeah, and Jeremy's the only guy that has like ten thousand books in his Kindle. Like, like I said, you guys all have your own. You guys all have your own like uh, little niche that you. Uh, I'm now with. at three thousand one hundred and thirty books on my Kindle. That's a lot of that's a lot of fucking books, man. But you, you know, one thing too, Jeremy, you bit you you get beat up by the literary communities a lot. One of the things that they don't acknowledge is you've been doing this for a long fucking time. Mm -hmm. You have interviewed the who's who of small press fiction and you've been doing that for the better part of a decade it is true has it been a decade well wow. when did when did uh surreal grotesque start for so was, daniel daniel started surreal grotesque and i came later you know at the uh, end of it but uh, that was in 2000 uh 11 12 hang on yeah so that's eight or nine years when did you start that Surreal Sermons podcast? Uh, okay, so I'm looking at a, a certificate where I won uh, the award for best reader uh, at this uh, writers group. And that's when I was about to start with Surreal Grotesque as an editor. Uh, and the podcast followed like, like a week after that. So it was 2012 is what it says here. So. That I've been doing it, you know, since one form or another since 2012. So keep in mind, Jeff Burke acts like he is the like most seasoned veteran of uh, fiction editing. He's been a small press editor since 2009. He's only got three years on you. My thing about him is, how does he say that he has any type of freaking like credibility? I, I'm not saying that he doesn't, but it's like when you read interviews with him, it's like he was inspired to start getting all this stuff because he got a copy of Conqueror Worms at like a freaking bookstore. And like, it, it doesn't seem like he came from a literary background, did he? Or did no, he just like... Podcast kid. Yeah, so what, why, why does everyone like all of a sudden just freaking put him on pedestal? I don't know. That's what I mean. I mean, they act like Jeremy's not shit. Jeremy's been doing uh, uh, literary journalism for eight fucking years. Motherfuckers, yeah. I buy your books. I yeah. tell other people to buy your books. That should be enough, you spoiled brats. Yeah, and he reads more than freaking anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Other than, like, you know, a couple fake accounts that read like 600 books a year. But That's basically me putting food in your mouths, so stop being brats, you know? Not you guys, but I mean, you know, anybody who wants to say that I ain't shit or whatever, well, I guarantee you that I'm not hitting a bunch of you up for advanced reading copies. I buy them myself with my own hard-earned money, you know? Quit picking on skinny. <laughs> I, 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 it's a, it's a, nice to meet you. I, I You're a southern fried gentleman yourself. Huh? 
Skinny. All I hear is shenanigans on other people's part. Shame on those assholes. You know? <laughs> Skinny, this is Jeremy Maddox. He runs the Quiet Place podcast over on YouTube. Oh, really? One of my buddies. Well, we've been uh, fighting in the trench, fighting SJWs in the trenches for a long, long time together. And uh, this is this is actually Jeremy's first time on my uh, on my show, isn't it, Jeremy? Yeah. You, know, you did a you did a guest spot uh, on the podcast version. Uh, strange. Uh, what did I call that? Reading to strangers. When you announced that uh, I was coming on board, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, man, that that seems so long ago now. It's a long time ago now. Yeah. How's your old? How's the other Jeremy doing? Your old, your your old. Uh, He's good. He got real heavy into the Warhammer, um, the Warhammer Mini uh, community, and he does. He paints uh, paints Warhammer toys and uh, plays plays Warhammer at gaming shops and stuff. He got super heavy into that. I, mean, I don't know if you remember near the end of the uh, the run of uh, Reading to Strangers, we, we talked about – I got into it a little bit. I painted minis for a little while, and that got Jeremy super into it. He's still in it to this day. I had to get out. It was too rich for my blood. That's a, You think you spend a lot of money on, on books or comics. Man, you spend a fuckload of money on miniatures when you're in that that hobby. And you got to paint them, and you, and you got to get, you know, yeah, the, uh, the different – settings that to, to put them in right and oh it's a nightmare it's a nightmare i got out of it as fast as i got into it i got out of it skinny you got a skinny comics logo now yeah i made that today how about I know it doesn't look super fancy but i, I like minimalist stuff because it's what's really it? easy to replicate and what's what you're gonna call it huh you're gonna release otis stein under skinny comics well it's skinny ninja comics skinny uh, Ninja comics Is yeah the japanese it? writing there just says ninja says ninja okay Skinny Ninja Comics. It's good. It's yeah. Good. It's good branding. What is Otis Stein about? Oh, wow. Uh, it's about this uh, farmer, Otis, and his wife, Mary, falling on hard times. Otis decides to get some extra money. He's going to start to distill alcohol legally. Ends up getting exploded, and his wife can't deal with it, so she tries to bring him back. That's oh, okay. I, I, I get it. <laughs> oh, where are you? Where are you at? Are you, I, I, I detect a slight Alabama tone to your accent. Is that correct? Are you trying to dox me, bro? No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all right. Yeah, no, yeah, never mind. If they the city capital of the United States at one point in time. Oh, okay. <laughs> now we're just the capital of NASCAR and big ass moon pies that cost tens of thousands of dollars that we waste money on every year. Are you in Tennessee too? Huh? Are you in Tennessee too? No. Oh. No, I don't I know like Tennessee capital. though. I don't know I what the capital of NASCAR is, but uh, it's in the South, definitely. I, I thought it would have been the Bristol Speedway in Tennessee. Right. I don't know if y'all ever saw that one comedian. Uh, shit, who was it? It's the guy with the puppets, Jeff Dunham. Oh, yeah. When he does the joke about, oh, they're making a left turn. That's a whole damn race. It's so exhausting. I swear. NASCAR has the only point to NASCAR is who can hold their shit the longest. It's purely endurance. No skill. I don't feel nearly as southern as the rest of my guests tonight. Doug was in Tennessee. You guys are all southern, and I'm in southern Illinois, which is not nearly southern enough. Southern is a frame of mind, sir. <laughs> No, I get it. What I, 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 there, there are differing frames of mind in the South, just like there are differing accents in Tennessee, and some of them are more annoying than others. I've been yeah, real feminine ones to one I hate. Honestly, one thing that really bothers me is my wife's from Washington State, so she has a lot of friends and family up there. And I see some of her more trashy friends uh, who have many children, still not married, yada, yada, yada. But they keep, like, putting on Facebook posts and stuff like this. Uh, I'm a Southern girl. I'm proud of it. And I'm like, dude, like, the only way you could get further north is if you were Canadian or from Alaska. Yeah. Like, I, I appreciate you liking the Southern culture, but please don't don't run around saying you're Southern when you're, you know, top left part of the United States. I've been, I've been all over this country, coast to coast, up and down, left and right, and uh, I've always said that my favorite place to do conventions is uh, is in uh, Kentucky. Lexington and Louisville, Kentucky have the nicest fucking people. 
Yeah, I gotta give credit to Arizona. I don't know how the whole state is, but the Tucson area was always fantastic as far as people. God, I would hate to be in that heat, though. All it's all. actually not bad. It's dry. Like, I know that's a stereotype, but, dude, going from here where it's like 94 degrees with 100% humidity go, to going up there where it's like 112 degrees, mm -hmm. I didn't feel the heat up there at all. And I didn't sweat so much. I had to change clothes eight times a day. Mm. It was amazing. I loved it. I like New Mexico. Well, only Roswell, but like the rest of it. I hear it's pretty bad, like super bad economies. Yeah, New Mexico, I, I call that the land of nothing. And every time I drove through there, it was just an barren wasteland as far as the eye can see. So you get up to Albuquerque. Uh, bad, bad, uh, bad for tornado weather, probably. And cockroaches, apparently. I got a few friends that live out there. Oh. Like the roaches have invaded like the west side of the city. It's crazy. Wonder why. Yeah, just shitty people not cleaning up after themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking people. Um Isn't it funny how now the, the homeless uh are are it's like the, the normal people in these big cities, the leaders are treating them like they're untouchable, you know, um disgusting, disease ridden peasants, but they're the same people who were were okay with the homeless shitting in the streets like a few a month before. What three really before the, the, these giant uh, clusters of homeless people in like L.A. and other cities? They're not. Uh, why aren't they contracting this COVID like and dying in these in, in extreme rates? It's not because the homeless are so dirty that even COVID couldn't survive that mm -hmm. shit. <laughs> As well, it might be highly contagious. It really takes a weak immune system for it to do a lot of damage. And homeless people have fantastic immune systems. Yeah, I think that's really the the uh, the, the 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 case. We did two. We did about two hours on fucking COVID last night. So let's not get into that. That went on and on and on on the quiet place, didn't it, Jeremy? Yeah. I don't think that was two hours of COVID. I think that was two hours of like like five percent talking about COVID just repeated. Like the same exact thing well, on like a record. The only thing I want to say about that is that here next month in June will be the launch of Corona Kings Volume 2, a free PDF filled with all kinds of comics and stuff like that. And that's from the comicsunderground.com, is that right? Yes, you got it. Corona Kings. It's free yeah. free web comics uh, from Skinny and his uh, and his buddies over on the comic side. Yeah, we figure uh, one of the guys wanted to do something nice for people. They were all getting laid off. You know, we've got a lot of friends out of work. So he's like, hey, anybody want to contribute something for like a free, you know, anthology kind of thing for Corona? I was like, yeah, sure. A bunch of other people did too. So I think it's 101 pages. 101 pages of free comics. Yeah. Uh, the comics on oh. com. Not just comics. There is like a 50-page, I guess you would call that a novella. Uh, and it's by uh, Yaakov Merkin. He's an Israeli author. He's actually really good. So he even threw something in there. Nice. Cool. Nice. Um, strange, I'm about to drop off. Nothing personal. Just uh, having trouble yeah. keeping my eyes open. Oh, Not yeah. the show, just because... I, I've been, you know, cleaning all day and, uh, you know, doing errands to get this or that, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I'm pretty beat. So I think I'm going to. That's all right. Off. I'm happy you came in tonight. You're welcome anytime. It's hard to. Uh, I, I have a, a little uh, private um, Facebook group chat where I just throw the link every night. And since you're not on Facebook, it's hard to uh, coordinate. Throw it, you know, you're welcome anytime, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But uh, the, link, the link is a little difficult to disperse around to everybody that's not because uh, Chris Lesko, he he dropped off of Facebook, too, and he wants to be contacted through Goodreads. So there's like a bunch of different places I have to throw the link if I want to try to get everybody in. But uh, you guys, you know, you're always welcome anytime. Yeah, Lesko's a good, good guy. Uh, so he's, he's been on here, too. No, I haven't brought Lesko on yet, but I, I reached out to him, added him to my 
Facebook group and said, you know, you're welcome to come on and read that fucked up fiction you write any, anytime you want because he's a he's a killer guest on uh, on the yeah. uh, on the quiet. Yeah, he, he's uh, he's kind of guy you would want to party with. You know, well, you know, at one time anyway. But uh, yeah, uh, have a good night, guys. And, and it was a blast to meet Doug Tenaple. Yeah, I'm glad you were here for that. Yeah, and we'll get him uh, on the quiet place too. He's a good he's a good dude. Yeah, yeah. There was no preachiness. I appreciated that. You know, uh, we'll get it. We're going to get him to get preachy, but uh, we won't get him to get preachy on the quiet place. We'll get him preachy here. <laughs> All right, whatever. I'm going to bed. So Wait, get- I think we need to get the preachiness on the quiet place. No, well, there you go. No, that's not. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys though later. Thanks for coming by. Yep, fellas. I'm about done too. I don't really have much more in me. Skinny, you came on late. We've been doing. We've been going up. Almost two hours now. I drew a page and had Doug on. We're just leaving because I got here. I don't know yeah, you know it. It's okay. You, know, you told me you're on vacation all week, and here I am running away. Dude, I earned this shit. I will say that. Holy shit, work has been a living hell. I saw you. Yeah, I, I finally put in for my vacation. I'm taking my vacation from next Monday to the following Monday, and I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I looked at doing a vacation in uh, South Florida, but all their – Hotels are still closed, so I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do. I might go on a float trip. Uh, the Hoosaw River, Hoosaw River Valley in uh, uh, southern Missouri is open, so I might take a drive. It's only about an hour from here. I might drive down to southern Missouri and uh, do some uh, kayaking. That'd be pretty cool. I went to the beach like on my first day of vacation. We got up at five thirty in the morning to go down to the beach, so that way we could beat all the crowds. The Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, well, the place that we get, went to is uh, Dolphin Island, which, you know, is, it is the Gulf Coast. But it's actually uh, a stretch of water between uh, Dolphin Island and uh, I forget what the island's called, but there's this uh, Fort Morgan on there, which is from, like, uh, the Revolution or what have you. Really cool place filled with history. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you could, like, walk across this entire stretch, which is, like, maybe – you know, 100, 150 miles or some shit like that. Wow. And it won't get any higher than like maybe six, seven feet. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's insane, but it's cool. I tried to talk my wife into going to the Escatapa River down here. I was like, well, the hell with that. I was like, let's go to the campgrounds. She's like, why? I was like, because they don't allow alcohol, so there won't be a bunch of assholes. <sighs> And we can also rent a canoe and just, like, canoe down the river. Because, like, the Escataba River, uh, I'll send you pictures of it, but it's really beautiful, man. It's, yeah. Because it's one it has got all these sandy beaches next to it and everything, so you can just, like, cruise on down and get your own little private beach where you won't be bothered by a bunch of dipshits. That's cool. What I, I really like about the, the Hoosaw is they have two sides of this road, one side of the road is for party people with, with alcohol and the other side has a curfew and is more for families. And so you can, you can go to the who's and have any kind of a sort of a float trip you want. You can do the crazy drinking, have 20 people in a, in a raft, or you can do uh, much more subdued and family <clears throat> style. See, we got something like that down here on the sticks river too, but it's just the party stuff where uh, you pull up a bus you park somewhere and then you get on a bus with your cooler and your friends or whatever. And they drive you like way up river and you get off and they, they've got inner tubes and they have ones to put your cooler into. And you just like spend the entire day. just That's how the river is. Yeah. They put you on a bus, drive you way up river, toss you in. And then what's, what I like to do is uh, over on the family side, uh, they have uh, campsites that uh, butt up right against the river. And so if you put your campsite in the right spot, you can you can do your float trip and about four, it'll be about an eight hour float trip down the river. About four hours in, you'll hit your own campsite. You can pull over to your own campsite and have a have lunch and chill out, take a nap, and then get back on your raft or your canoe and finish the float. Yeah. Really cool. That's why I love it down. That's why I love it down here. It's like the only thing that's cool about Alabama. Is we have all these rivers and shit to do cool stuff like that on. Oh yeah, I'm scared of rivers ever since I went uh, doing a, like a class four rapid thing on an ROTC trip in high school. 
And I, I kind of refuse to ever get in one again. <laughs> it's horrible. Oh, you won't see right? any of that kind of kind of shit down here, like whatsoever. I mean, this is legit, like lazy ass river. Like yeah. it's a small world after all, kind of shit. Yeah, I'm good with that. But after falling, that like when once you fall out of the boat, go like in the freaking rapid and end up under the boat, it freaking sucks. See, like I see people do those like white rapid things. And that scares the shit out of me just looking at it. Like, oh, yeah, like, totally why would I want to do that? Like, <laughs> there are so many other things that aren't as dangerous that I would like to do. And then you got people taking their dogs and shit on this. Yeah. We got the dog in the fucking rapids with them. Well, fellas, I think we're done here for the night. Yeah. I think we'll pick it up again later in the week. I appreciate you guys uh, coming in. Skinny, you're always. Uh, Welcome. We got to see this uh, cover for Otis Stein when you uh, when you when you get it back when it's finished. You got to reveal yeah. it. I, I'm I'm looking for Carlos to be done probably on Thursday. Which, Hell yeah! Which is usually you know he turns in a page every week and he's always on time if not early. So Hell yeah. he's awesome, man. All right. Well, we're gonna call it. Uh, Andrew in the chat says good night, fellas. Good night, Andrew. Thanks for hanging out. Hope you enjoyed uh, Doug's visit. Like I said, I, I know I went geeky and got him talking, uh, uh, drawing and illustration this time. But we'll get him talking some, some real fun stuff uh, next time. So uh, thanks, guys. And remember to uh, keep it strange. All up in Strangeville.